Boylan had been working a long time. When he came to Nashville, and I think it was 66, and began his uh, path, and by 76, he had broken the sound barrier with the Outlaws album, which sold more records than any country music record had sold before. And it was in the late 70s that he was offered to do the, this great series, The Dukes of Hazard, And uh, he had a lot of fun doing it. It just made sense that with his position of being the hottest thing in the country, that it would be a recipe for success, I would think. I had known Waylon, I worked with him on another project. And so we brought Waylon in. Now Waylon was my only choice. I never, uh, I never saw anybody else. And, and once they heard Waylon, they saw what I meant because he just had this sound. Uh, at this point, remember, we were breaking new ground. Nobody had ever seen a show like this. And as a result, the audience knew what was going on. The critics never got it, but we didn't write it for the critics. The outlaw movement as such, which means, you know, functioning outside the system, was only, um, you know, Waylon doing the same thing he had always done, working, uh, loving his music, passionately driven. The Dukes of Hazzard is full of outlaws. I mean, they're doing things they're not supposed to do, all of them. A bunch of crooks. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, so lovable. As so often the criminals and the crazy people are, they're lovable, you know? And uh, definitely it has the outlaw fabric to it. Wait a minute, we also got to check with Boss Hogg about it. Boss Hogg, what's he got to do with you leaving? Well, a few years back, me and Bo got busted for moonshine and we're yeah. on probation. Yeah, Uncle Jesse made a deal with the government. We'll tell you all about it on the plane, but don't you worry. And this is a very historical, serious matter. I mean, that's where the NASCAR drivers first came from. You know, so I think the fact that it was handled with an extra bit of humor had, was very smart. Because, I mean, it's, a, it's an illegal activity. What, what were the three of us? Were we good guys or bad guys? You know, there were people in those days that were telling so us we were that terrible. we were the bad guys. You yeah. guys had no jobs. My, my shorts were too short. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We never paid I couldn't be a feminist. We lived on your tip like money. I'm, I'm sorry. My what? <laughs> <laughs> on your tip money. Shame From on you. Tip Shame money. Shame on you. <laughs> what, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I had both the arena in mind, a small country s town in the south, and the characters, the three main characters, Bo, Luke, and Daisy, all came from the same general area uh, because we were dealing in the car culture of the south. So our link with country music and with the country music audience was critical. So what we decided to do, and I, I fought very hard for this with the producer, I said, well, we don't have a narrator, we have a balladeer. And I said, the perfect voice for that is Waylon Jennings. Fighting the system like a two modern day Robin Hood. <laughs> yeah, now the function of the ball balladeer was to give us that, that each story was a ballad, and so he kind of kicked it off the same way. It also gave us a narration uh, for every show, so that every time we got into trouble, the balladeer could come in and make some comment, like a Greek chorus. Okay, boys, start talking. Now, where's that car? Remember, friends, this old boy is a pretty fair shot. Uh, and his ability to kind of tell a story in such a way that you get it and the punchline's great, uh, that was all the same element going on in the Dukes of Hazard, I think. The advantage was that we could do this country style. We could, so some of our better jokes we, we would give to Whalen because he would comment on what was going on. You see, back then, old boss was so cheap that he wouldn't even hire a deputy sheriff, a police dog, or even a moderately alert chihuahua. Roscoe! Santa Claus is going to steal bosses! Oh! To be a southerner is to laugh at yourself. That's what gothic southern humor is. Part of his humor is making fun. It is, it's a self-deprecating thing, but there's a, a great element of pride in it because it's part of it is survival. Those subtleties the network did miss, and sometimes their attitude was, uh, well, don't make fun of the South, and we have to explain, we're not making fun of the South. If it hadn't been for me, you wouldn't have been in this trouble to begin with.
He was the perfect one, just in the sense that he had also, he had a very left-handed sense of humor. You know, he... He was his own man. Did you listen to some of the songs that he wrote, some of the stuff like, you know, if you see me getting smaller, I'm leaving. You know, stuff yeah, like yeah. that. Get your tongue out of my mouth, I'm kissing you goodbye, he said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he had a very left-handed kind of sense of humor. I, I mean, that. oh, <laughs> you, you, he oh, sang it a lot in his in his shows. It's like he had a secret, and there was something dangerous going on in Waylon's voice. As much as funny as it was, there was an edge to it. Well, there's it was also like, that natural compression that he had, you know, yeah, in yeah. his voice. Boys, here's a little token of appreciation for the risk that you two took. I only gave him one hat. That'd give him something to fight over. <laughs> The first time that the network and the studio saw exactly what we meant was in the first episode. When we have this, in the first act, we have all this crazy stuff going on that makes no sense at all, and people are being chased, and I think we had a piano on a truck, and the truck was in a chase, and there's a piano bouncing around, and it's come time for the break. We hit the break, and Waylon's voice comes on and says, ain't this fun? And I got a call from the network, and they said, that's what we want. <laughs> he said, there we are. We don't have another show that can do that. Well, he Just definitely the tied the show together. Yeah, he did. Because, boy, without, without his help as balladeer, we would have been up the creek without the well-known paddle. That's right. Or, or up the, the well-known writers, creek. Because the, no. the writers would ride up the creek without a canoe. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All that I heard was, your theme's ready. And he sent it. And we heard it. And there was nothing else to say. There was no, that's exactly, that was what we wanted. And the thing that had surprised us, and surprised me, was I thought he was gonna do a, a more of an up-tempo. I thought the tempo was gonna be faster. And he gave that thumping hard bass and bass drum kick to it which starts it in this slow thing. And the network first said, well, isn't that too slow? We want a light, bright, up, catchy thing. And the thing we came back with was, no, let's take, let's take what he's done, because the next sound you're gonna hear is gonna be at presto molto, which is gonna be as fast as we can play. And so we can kick this thing off from a slow theme. The next thing you hear is, oh my God, we're on the air. Fighting the system like a two modern day Robin Hood. Yeah! All of a sudden we cut back and we're almost always using an up tempo thing. But Whalen's sense of, no, we want a theme that really works and says something about these boys. And that's what he did. When he sent it, I was totally surprised by it. And please. And they were giving him a, a timeline. It seemed like it was 30 days. And he couldn't get he couldn't get the last a few phrases, and it was kind of hard to come by. They just fell together the last night. I said, yeah, that's cool, you know. Then when they went in and cut it, it just rocked, you know. Do you remember the first time you heard the song? I was just so proud of the song not. because it, it didn't matter that it was country or it was rock and roll or whatever it was, it was cool. I remember that uh, the show was not on the air yet. And, and we came to At Warner Brothers mm -hmm. and we saw the pilot of the show. We watched the show and I, my memory is that that was the first time I realized that Waylon Jennings was doing the, ah. the theme song. It was like, my God, listen to that. And there were our pictures and there's the bow and arrows and there's the car and all that, but that was Waylon Jennings that was pretty cool. singing behind, that was behind our pictures. And I thought, this is, this is too good to be true and the reaction you get to that song. Oh my gosh. It's stunning. Like in Nashville, in Nashville. a couple months ago. Unbelievable. I just think that everybody still relates to it. I mean, yeah. It just... Well, so to get to sing that song now, I mean, it's, uh, 
It's pretty cool. It's awesome. At the beginning of the show, he'd, it wasn't him playing guitar. When we first did the first episodes, remember there was an acoustic guitar? Yes. One yeah, it looked like Harry Chapin's, like, like and they, Tom Chapin. they changed him around. We were shooting somewhere not far from where we're sitting at a junkyard, not the original junkyard in Georgia. Right, right. We were here, and I remember they brought in a, a, a bed sheet or a tarp or something, and he came to visit on the set, and that's when they cut, they filmed that. You remember? Because Waylon was coming to the set. It was really cool, and he came out and did that. That's great. I remember that day because I remember I held that guitar. Just a good old boy. The good old boys, you know. That song, um, Dukes of Hazard theme song, was actually the biggest selling single. And the fact that he was considered, you know, one of them, and certainly part of the Dukes. Uh, fits because he cared so much when he wrote the song. He cared so much when he would tell the story. Uh, he cared to continue it in all of his shows. I'd like to dedicate this song to Jesse, Bo, and Luke, and Daisy for making everything come out right for me in the museum while here in Hazard. All were friends. And it was really neat because Shooter, when he was about two, Waylon turned to him and said, son, which one of the Duke boys is your favorite? <laughs> and he said, Daisy. <laughs> and he was just two, so he had a good eye even then. <laughs> when we got to Hazard, everybody figured all the excitement was over. But I should have known better. Uh, the first time I met Waylon was when I was writing songs. And um, I was with Dwayne Eddy, married to Dwayne Eddy at the time. and. Waylon says, bring her on in, we'll, we'll cut a demo of one of her songs. So I went to the studio, and he was most gracious, and, and, and always a gentleman. And then it was two years later that both of us were divorcing and divorced, and um, we uh, saw each other here in Phoenix. He was playing JD's. I sang on stage, and he leaned over during the song and said, you want to run away? He said, ask me in six months. <laughs> <laughs> he also referred to her as a poor little ugly thing. Say, ain't she a poor little ugly Which, thing? You know, She's st stunningly she beautiful. Yes. Yeah. Oh, he used to call me a good looking mooch, barely can sing. That's what he'd say when he'd introduce me. He'd just make you like him, and he'd tear you up and make you like it, you know? First time I met Waylon was actually in the ADR room at Warner Brothers. We were looping, and he brought that piece of paper with the. Um, a little boy somewhere gave him a piece of paper and he wanted an autograph and it looked, it had been in that pants pocket for a long time. <laughs> but he got it to Bo, which was cool. I mean, here was Waylon Jennings holding onto a piece of paper from a little kid. Uh, his memory as, was great for thoughtful things like that. You know, more than just the music, if the man is able to break through, to be believable, to be someone people can believe in, and Waylon was that, that goes a long way. And so you got the man, plus the music, you know, that people, people identified with him. He was so believable because he was what he was. And no secrets. I, my understanding is we wouldn't have, Dukes, not we, we weren't we yet, uh, that it was sold solely because Waylon Jennings, who just sold a million, or shipped a million, I've always been crazy, uh, was the hottest thing in the world. Uh, but so many people didn't even know he was the balladeer. Only people, uh, well, but it's so, it, it's made the deal ah. because he had said he would do it. I guess he had told told the uh, guy? guy guy that he would do it. So that was really that was really cool. So if Waylon had not blessed it, then those cool. first five shows wouldn't have wouldn't have been done, and we would not be here today. I just want to say that if you thought Waylon was cool, if you thought he was the greatest, if you loved Waylon, you were loving the right man. He was. He was everything that you saw. He was every melody, every note he sang was true. There'll never be another one like him. Nope. No, that's for darn sure. We had a, an amazing seven year run, uh, getting to do things that no other show had gotten a chance to do. Right now, where I am is just learning to live. You know, without Waylon and doing my music, I have great 
great memories that will always be with me. And I take him with me.